So the three model organisms that we're going to study today for this lecture are all invertebrate model organisms. So the first one is the sea urchin. These are commonly used mainly for fertilization and cleavage. So we look at, we use them to study the fertilization process that occurs in development, as well as the initial cleavage processes that occur in development. One of the reasons why we use these is because they're easy to collect. There's lots and lots of them. So they spawn in huge amounts of quantities. You get a lot of data from them. They're very easy to use in laboratory conditions and to grow in, in labor, laboratory conditions. So the fertilization process can be done in a laboratory. We can watch their development under a microscope. So it's very advantageous. The cells are clear. You can watch them dividing. Um, you can see it pretty much all the way through the end. The embryos are transparent. The envelope that surrounds them, in a lot of cases, that's not the, the case where you can't see what's going on inside. But with sea urchins, you can see what's going on inside. I'm going to show you a couple more videos. I've already showed you some of them, which I'm going to show you again. But that's why we, we use these as a model organism is because of all of these factors. We can, we can manipulate them in a laboratory environment. We can watch them develop under a microscope. There's a lot that we can do. They spawn in massive quantities. The, the main disadvantage of you have to collect these embryos or these organisms and then work with them in the laboratory. We can't propagate the species under laboratory conditions. It's hard to take them once they reach maturity and then go through the process all over again. So that is one disadvantage of using sea urchins is, is unlike when we're doing frogs or mice or chickens, it's, you can't really reproduce them in laboratory conditions uh, due to the nature of their development and, uh, and subsequent uh, maturation. But these are all the advantages that we use for sea urchins. Make sure you know those. So let's look at sea urchins' mode of cleavage. Okay? As because of the distribution of the yolk, in the animal pole, you get these middle-sized cells, which we call mesomeres. The vegetable pole having a little bit thicker yolk, they don't divide as uh, much, so you get slightly larger cells, which we call macromeres. But then at the very, very tip of the vegetable pole, you get these tiny cells, which we call micromeres. Now, these cells are critical in the development of the sea urchin. If you look at a fate map of the sea urchin, even before the cell divides, what do you see? Even before the first cell division, what's the fate map showing you? You already have the three germ layers that are being established. Why? What is making it so that those are pre-established? The asymmetrical distribution of the molecules in the oocyte that will create different proteins or morphogenic gradients that will be sequestered as these cells undergo cell division. So you can see that after the first few cell divisions, the maternal components that will cause these cells to become ectoderm are sequestered within the cytoplasm of those cells. Those maternal components which are found here are going to be sequestered to these regions here and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's what we were talking about at the beginning about these molecules being asymmetrically distributed within the cytoplasm of the oocyte. These are done by cells outside of the oocyte. You know, we typically call these nursing cells that will put these various molecules in various places in the initial stages of oocyte development. Now, one of the things you have to know about the micromeres, we, ha we haven't really talked too much about what we call organizers, but the micromeres are under pure autonomous specification. Now, this is where things might get a little dicey, so pay close attention. If we were to separate these cells out and let them develop on their own, the maternal components that are in these cells will develop autonomously. However, these cells will only go so far without interaction with the other cells. So in reality, all of these cells, these mesomeres and macromere cells, are under conditional specification because they do require interactions with other cells 
to ultimately develop or undergo the specification they need for, uh, um, uh, for their development. The micromeres, on the other hand, are not influenced by the interaction with the other cells. And they themselves can develop autonomously without any type of interaction with these other cells, which is why we see that the micromeres develop, have autonomous specification, but the meso and macromeres here are under conditional specification. So these cells, in fact, require interactions with these micromeres, paracrine factors, as well as juxtacrine factors. So both paracrine and juxtacrine interactions are required between the micromeres and these other cells for them to fully develop, for them to take on their respective fates, which is why these cells we call conditional specification because it does require interaction with these micromeres. The micromeres, on the other hand, are under autonomous specification. They don't receive signals from these other cells to differentiate into the types of cells that they need to become. So remember I told you that these were transparent. That's why we can see these cells dividing at the various stages. Now this fluid-filled center, what do we call that? The blastocele, the blastocele. This is the fluid-filled area that's necessary for the later stages of gastrulation that are going to occur. So what happens is these cells will start dividing and then through osmosis, water will be pulled in to create this internal liquid environment that causes the cells to be pushed out to the periphery of the uh, um, blastocyst. Pretty much all of the cells, except for the micromeres, are under conditional specification. Just those mesoderm cells, those micromeres that are at the vegetal pole, are under autonomous specification. The anterior-posterior axis is determined primarily by the animal vegetal pole. The animal pole is the anterior axis of the sea urchin. The vegetal pole is the posterior axis. These are predetermined by those maternal components that are in the oocyte uh, uh, before cleavage even begins. So in, you'll find that in, some, uh, in the next example I give you, the anterior posterior axis is, is actually determined by where the sperm enters rather than pre-established maternal components. So it's not the same in every organism. So here's the anterior portion, the animal pole. Here's the posterior portion, portion, the vegetal pole. Here we have the mesomeres, the macromeres, and then those micromeres. Um, again, why is this vegetal pole, why is this mesoderm if it's supposed to be in between ectoderm and endoderm? What's going to happen? Invagination. These cells, some of these cells are going to invaginate. The micromeres are actually going to ingress. What does ingression mean? They become disconnected. They're going to go from an epithelial to mesenchyme transition. They're going to move inward towards where that blastocele is at. And a lot of these are going to form what we call the skeletal rods, which are part of the skeletal system of the sea urchin. So here are some of the respective fates. We start off with the initial zygote. And as the mesomeres and the macromeres and the micromeres start dividing up, you can see, based upon the color, ectoderm, neural tissue. Remember, neural is a little bit darker um, blue. Um, I'm not going to differentiate between some of these different colors of oranges, but we have endoderm and then we have mesoderm. So most of the mesoderm comes from the most, uh, the, 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 the largest uh, micromeres at the um, bottom of the uh, uh, vegetal pole. So here's, once the blastocyl forms, this is kind of the fate map of the cell. You can see already that the uh, mesoderm is already getting ready to uh, um, uh, ingress, and then the endoderm actually envelops here and then invaginates. So you can see that these micromeres start ingressing inward. These play a, a vital role. These are under autonomous specification that will start conditioning other cells to become what they're to become. Eventually, all these uh, uh, mesoderm cells ingress, and the endoderm starts invaginating. So these cells start invaginating. This is eventually going to form uh, the, uh, the gut. Remember that the endoderm forms the digestive system of an organism. Once this extends all the way through, then it's going to be essentially the anus in the posterior region to the mouth.
That's the digestive system of the sea urchin. You can see how these mesoderm, these micromeres, eventually become the skeletal rods or the skeletal system of the organism. And then, of course, you have the ectoderm and some of the neural tissue that surrounds this organism. We don't, take, we don't really use this too much to study some of the later stages, as I said. Mostly it's used for fertilization and the initial stages of cleavage when we study um, distribution of maternal components and these mRNAs and such. But I just wanted to point out some key factors. Here we have Wnt signaling with the beta-catenin pathway. We have notch delta signaling. These are some of the factors that are required for the conditioning of the endoderm from the mesoderm. So the mesoderm, these micromeres, are the signaling center. They're going to release Wnt signaling that's going to then signal the Wnt uh, pathway in the endoderm cells, and these will then start turning on various genes that are necessary for them to invaginate and form the digestive system of the sea urchin. So that's why these are under autonomous specification. They already have all their own signals, but they will then condition or send out paracrine signaling to condition many of the other cells that are adjacent to them, especially the endoderm. Then beta-catenin pathway will, will actually uh, cause transcription of very specific genes that will then cause these cells to become specified to be endoderm. Here again, you can see this is an electron scanning micrograph. So this is a very high resolution, high detail showing of the invagination of the endoderm cells of the vegetal pole. 